Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this presentation. Thank you so much for attending my presentation. I'm Mauricio, I work as a software engineer for Microsoft, and today I will be presenting you how to collect low-level metrics by using BPF. So, yeah, in the agenda of today, I want to introduce the concept of metrics. I hope that you, many of you are already familiar with that, otherwise this is just a quick introduction to metrics. And the same for eBPF. I will be covering very quickly what eBPF is and some concepts that we need to understand the, the content of this talk. Then after that, I will be speaking what is the relationship between metrics and eBPF. And finally, I will be presenting some of the projects that we can use to collect metrics by using BPF. Okay, so there we are. So, a metrics, mm, by definition, a metric is a measurement of a service capture or runtime. So, we can think of a metric like a number that represents the performance of, of the help of our service. So, yeah, examples of metrics are the, CP, the percentage of CPU that our system is using, the quantity of RAM that our system is using, Mm, the error rate of the response, the throughput of our system, or yeah, basically any numeric measurement that you can do on your system that represents the performance of that. So why do we need metrics? Well, by using metrics, we are able to understand if our service is available, and also we are able to understand what is the performance of our service. Yeah, for sure, probably many, many of you get alerts when a metric is changing on the system, when there is a, an outage. So, yeah, we, we can configure those roles uh, to understand when there is an issue with our system. And another thing that we can use metrics for is to perform trigger scheduling decisions. So, if we need to allocate more resources for our system, or maybe if we have so many resources and we need to remove some of them for our system. Mm, there are different kind of metrics. So the first one is like the simplest one to understand is the counter. So the counter is a numeric mm, value that only can go up. So we can use counters for representing the, the numbers of packets that are being sent on a system, the total, uh, the number of requests that are being processed, and so on. The second one is gauges. So gauges are is also a single numerical type that can go up or down. An example of gauge could be the CPU usage on our system. So we can have high CPU usage, but it can go down or up. Mm, the same for memory. So we can our system could consume more or less memory. So yeah, that's a numeric value that can go down or up. And the last one. Well, I forgot to say that this is the definition according to Prometheus. If you go to open telemetry, there is like a different definition, but in the end, the, the core concept is the same for all of them. So histograms are the more, like the most difficult one to explain. So the idea there is that we make a measurement, we divide the range of possible values into different buckets, and then when we have the measurement, we increase the counter for some of those buckets. So, yeah, histograms are used for latency measurements in general, so they provide some statistical information about what is going on with our system there. So, what is the average response time, or if there are any outliers, and things like that. Okay, and the other concepts that I want to introduce very quickly today about metrics are the dimensions. So, when we perform a measurement, we not only care about the numerical value, but we only take additional information for that metric. So those are dimensions called labels or also attributes. So for instance, when, if we are taking the number of packets that are being sent on a system, we only not care about all the packets, but we, not, but we want to provide additional information on those. For instance, what is the network interface where we are sending those packets? What is the IP protocol and so on? So, Dimensions are important because by using there, we are able to aggregate the data. So in the, in the example that we have there, for instance, if we only care about a specific, uh, if we only care about the network interface, we can aggregate the data. We can remove the IP protocol label so we can get data by specific network interface. And also, we can perform filtering. So for instance, if we only care about IPv4, we can filter all other values there. 
So the, the cardinality of a metric refers to the number of combination of the labels. So in, the, in this case, the cardinality is four because we have two different interfaces, two different values for the IP protocol. So what, what is the point about cardinality? When we capture metrics, we want to keep the cardinality as high as possible because we want to have as much information as possible. But when we have high cardinality, we, our observability system need more resources, especially memory. So we have to find the right balance there. We need as detailed as possible information, but at the same time, we don't want to consume a lot of resources in our observability application. So this is going to be important in a second when I will show you how to collect metrics. Okay, I know it was a very fast introduction of metrics. Let's switch to the second topic that is BPF. So what is BPF? BPF is an in kernel by code virtual machine. So basically with the BPF, we can take programs that are provided by the user and we can run those programs in the context of the kernel. What it means is that we are able to change the kernel behavior by running those programs that are provided by the user. Mm, there are different use cases for eBPF, tracing, networking, security. In this one, we are more interested in the tracing one because we want to get information about what is going on on the kernel by using BPF. So this is just to give you a quick introduction about why BPF is so popular right now. So I will say that there are three different things. The first one is that by using BPF, we are able to bring flexibility to the kernel. So we are able to change the behavior of the kernel without having to recompile the kernel. So that's very powerful because we can like something like implement new features in the kernel without having to recompile nor install a new version of that. The second one is efficient. So it provides a just-in-time compilation approach. What it means is that it translates from eBPF instructions to machine instructions on the flight. And it gives us a very good performance there because there is no like an emulation in that. And the last one is for sure also very important. eBPF is safe. So the kernel has a mechanism that allow us to be sure that the BPF programs that we are running there are, are safe. So we cannot crash the kernel, we cannot access to memory that they are not allowed to. So we, we can say that BPF programs are running a sandbox in a way that those are safe to run. Okay, so yeah, I want to introduce a couple more concepts there just to be, just to be sure that we are able to understand the, the next topic. So eBPF programs are even driven. It means that when something happens on the kernel, our eBPF programs are executed. Mm, and the source of those events are called hooks. So what are examples of that? For instance, network devices, we can attach our eBPF program to different network devices. And when a packet is received or sent through that network device, our eBPF program is secured. But for, for this specific talk, the most interesting one are, are the first one. So we have K probes at three, and three points. So those are hooks in the kernel that allow us to attach those eBPF programs to any function within the kernel. So for instance, we need to understand what is going on on a specific function of the kernel. We attach the program there, and each time that that function is executed in the kernel, our eBPF program is run. So from there, we are able to understand what are the parameters of the function, what is the return value of the function, what is the process user or whatever that is running that specific function. So the interesting thing is that we can attach to almost whatever point in the kernel that we want. There are other cases, but I will skip them for now because those are not so interesting for, for this uh, specific use case. So this is how it looks like. We have an observability application. So this is the application that, that performs the observability. It runs or it injects better different eBPF programs in the kernel that are attached to different hook points there, for instance, storage, networking, syscalls. And then we have the processes that we are monitoring on the system. So those processes need to interact through the system by using syscalls. So by having those eBPF programs in the kernel, we are able to understand the activity that those processes are performing, like sending ne network packets, calling functions in the kernel, accessing the disk, and so on. 
Uh, another concept that, that I need to explain is, well, with those eBPF programs, we are able to capture information from the kernel, but then we need a place to store that information. So th that is what the eBPF maps are for. So we can think about those maps as a key value structures that are used to, as, to share information between different eBPF programs and also between eBPF programs and user space applications. So basically the idea is that the eBPF program runs, it grabs, it gets some information from the kernel, it stores that information in those BPF maps, and then our application from user space pulls those uh, that data. Okay, so yeah, I know it was a very quick introduction on eBPF, but I just wanted you to have like a general idea before I go to the next topics. Okay, so what is the relationship of metrics and eBPF? Right, so with eBPF, we can get a very deep insights of the, what is going on in the kernel. So I, as I was explaining before, we can attach to any, to any kernel function, so we can get very low level information there. And for sure, also as mentioned before, it's flexible, efficient, and safe, so it makes like the perfect tool to get these low level details on the kernel. There are different projects that provide metrics by using BPF. In this talk, I will cover in three of them, but for sure there are many more I'm not aware of. Okay, so let me show you the first one of them. This is called BPF Exporter. This is by Cloudflare. So yeah, the definition that we can find in their website is this is a Prometheus exporter for custom BPF metrics. So this is important to, to, realize, to understand that this is for custom BPF metrics. So the idea there is that the user can write their own BPF programs to get that information and then the BPF exporter is going to export and to expose that information as Prometheus metrics. So they support counters and histograms. And yeah, so as mentioned before, when you are creating a, a program there or better, when you want to use this project, you need to create two things. The first one is the BPF program to get the metrics. And the second one is a configuration file that defines what is the format where those metrics are, are stored in the BPF map. So this is what the configuration file looks like. So you can see we have metrics, we have counters, some general information about the metrics like the name, help. I will show you in a second what labels is about. And yeah, depending on the kind of the metric, you have more uh, parameters, especially for, for the histogram regarding to the bucket configuration and so on. So there is something important to, to understand here is when we capture information from the kernel using BPF, many times we only capture like numerical identifiers of the things. So we need a way to convert that numerical identifiers to a human readable version. So the BPF exporter project does it by implementing something that they call the coders. So the idea is that we provide a number and by using a decoder, we are able to convert that to a human readable version. One example is the C group ID. So that's an integer on the kernel and by using the C group decoder, we are able to convert that or we are able to get the C group path from that uh, C group ID. And yeah, this is how we configure that on the labels. So we have the decoder, first we convert that to an integer and then that's converted to a C group path. Okay, so time for a demo about that. So if we go to the eBPF exporter website, we can see that they already provide some examples there. So for each of the examples, they have this eBPF program and the configuration file that is a YAML. So yeah, as you can see, they have a bunch of different examples ready to use. In this presentation, I want to show you this specific one about syscalls. So this is an example that provides metrics for different syscalls. So provides a counter for each syscall that is executed on the system. So this is the structure of the eBPF program. So we have an eBPF map to store the, the metrics. So as the key of that map, we have an integer. So this is the number of the syscall and value. We have another integer, so that will be the counter. And then this is the eBPF program that we use to capture 
when these calls are executed on our system. So yeah, the only thing that is done by that eBPF program is to increase a counter on the eBPF map. And then we have the configuration file for that. So yeah, we have metrics. We are defining a counter that we call syscalls. And in the labels here, we only have a single label that is called syscalls. And yeah, again, in this case, we have to use a decoder in order to convert the system call number to the name. Let me show you how we can run that. I don't have the time to go into all the details of this YAML manifest. I will only show you the most important part. So in this case, I'm using their official uh, container image. And he, there I'm saying what is the directory where the configuration files are stored and what is the, the one that I want to run. So in this case, it's only the this is calls one. Let me apply that. So a daemon set was created, Prometheus was also deployed. And if we go to the Prometheus interface, we can see that our metric is available there. So if I query the metric, I get the different values. So we have the name of the syscall, we have the counter for that. Mm, yeah, so there are a lot of different syscalls that are being executed on my system. But what, is it, what I want to highlight here is that we don't get any information about the Kubernetes spots. So we have like the syscall, but we don't have like what is the pod, what is the container that is performing those syscalls. This, this is because the BPF project exporter is not integrated with Kubernetes. So they, not, they don't provide that information. Okay, the other project that I want to talk to you today is Tetragon. So the, the definition of Tetragon is a flexible Kubernetes aware security, observability, and runtime enforcement tool. So by default, uh, Tetragon traces different events, like when processes are executed, syscall activity, IO activity. This includes networking and file access. And um, yeah, so Kubernetes aware means that it understands the different components of Kubernetes. In other words, it is able to provide information about the Kubernetes pod, the Kubernetes container, and so on. So let me show you a demonstration of that project. In this case, I already have Tetragon running on my system. So there is a Tetragon pod there, also a Tetragon operator running there. Um, Prometheus is configured to scrap the metrics from the, the endpoint. So. So if we go there, we can see that it produces different metrics. The one that we are interested on is called Tetragon Events Total. Again, so if we query the metric, we can see the, the information there. So it provides when a process was executed. So it provides the counter there. When the process finished execute, execution, it also provides a label for the binary that was executed. And yeah, so I'm looking here is also that for some of them, it also provides Kubernetes information. So we have the name space, we have the name of the pod where that activity was happening. So those are the metrics that we get by default when we deploy Tetragon. But what is interesting about Tetragon is that we can configure and we can get other metrics if we want. So uh, Tetragon defines a tracing policy custom resource. So by using that custom resource, we are able to say, hey, count a metric on that or on that, on another specific point on the kernel. So let me show you that. Actually, I should be showing that before applying, but anyway. Okay, so this is the tracing policy that I have configured there. So there I'm telling Tetragon, okay, attach, approve on a trace point, on the roses calls on this specific event. So this is like a other way to tell the program what to do. So in this case, we don't need to write BPF code. We are able to configure the metric by only writing this YAML file. So yeah, this example is very similar to the previous one. We are counting these calls, but in this case, we don't care about the BPF code. Okay, so let me go back to Prometheus. 
So if we list the different metrics available, we see that now we have this tetragon, these calls. So if we query that, we can see that the, the result is very similar to the eBPF exporter one, but the difference there is that we get information about Kubernetes or well. This is what I'm trying to look for there. So yeah, there it is. Yeah, right. So as you can see, it provides information for Kubernetes components there. Okay, and the final project I want to show you today is called Inspector Gadget. So as a disclaimer, I'm one of the maintainers of this project, so I will try to keep as neutral as possible, but for sure, this is the one that I like the most. So Inspector Gadget is a, is a tool designed for the creation, deployment, and execution of eBPF programs, both on Kubernetes and in Linux machines. So we can think of Inspector Gadgets as a Docker runtime for eBPF. So the idea is that you, as a developer, you create your own BPF program, you put that in an OCI image, you give that to Inspector Gadget, and Inspector Gadget will take care of injecting those, running those programs in the kernel. Um, yeah, another interesting thing about BPF is that, as I showed you before, uh, about Inspector Gadget story, is that when we get information from the kernel, we usually get low-level information. So we get the PID, we get the user ID, but there is no a com a container com set in the kernel. So Inspector Gadget provides that mapping, adding a context about container, pop name, and so on there. So specifically regarding about metrics, there are two different ways to support metrics in eBPF, in Inspector Gadget, sorry. One is in user space, and the other one is in kernel. So in user space metrics, in this case, we, we have different tools that already provide information, already provide events. So the idea of configuring the metrics in user space is to count the events that are generated by those already existing tools. So those tools, each time something happens, they send an event to user space, and then there we perform the counting, the aggregation and filtering of those events. So yeah, for sure this, this solution is less performant because we are sending all the events from kernel to user space, but it was also easier to implement. So that's like the initial support that we got for Prometheus there. And yeah, for sure this is up to the, to the user to configure how to count and how to aggregate the events. So this is configured by using a configuration file. This is based on the BPF exporter one. So yeah, as you can see, we have metrics, um, some gener generic information about the metrics, like the name, the type of the metric. This category and gadget refers to the existing tools that we, that we have. So if you want to use this, you have to go to our website, check the existing gadgets that we have, check what is the information that they provide in order to understand if they provide some events that are useful for you. Um, yeah, so we have selector labels. This is plain here. So selector is to filter out some of the, of the events that we don't want. So maybe we only care about events on a specific namespace and a specific pod, so we can configure that. And the labels define what is the granularity that we want for our metrics. So in this specific example, we are going to have a label for the pod name or for the container name. So let me show you how it works here. So this is a YAML manifest with all the configuration there. So this is the configuration file for Inspector Gadget that is stored as a config Mac on the cluster. So yeah, there I am defining a secure process metric that is going to use the trace ASIC gadget, so one of the, our existing tools. In this case, I didn't configure any filtering. And those are the labels that I configured for that example. So the Kubernetes namespace, the Kubernetes pod, the container, and the name of the process that was executed. 
Okay, and yeah, this is just to show you how we run that. So I'm using the one of the official inspector gadget container images, and this is the command line that, that we have to use to run this. So we say this is Prometheus, we pass the, the path to the configuration file, and that's it. So I deploy that. Again, a demon said was created, Prometheus is running, so this is really similar to the BPF exporter case. Before, yeah, in this case, it takes a little bit more until the metrics are available. And yeah, as you can see, we got our metric available there. So yeah, in this case, we have the labels that we configure there. So we have a Kubernetes name space, pod, the name of the process, and so on. So what is interesting about this approach is that, again, you don't have to worry about writing BPF. You can use our existing tools to uh, get some metrics, but it's less performant. So there is a trade-off there. And the other way that we can use to collect BPF metrics in Inspector Gadget is to count or to collect them directly in mm, kernel space. So in this case, the user has to develop their own BPF code the user has to define what, what is the granularity that they want to use. So yeah, very similar to the BPF exporter case, and for sure the, this is more performant than counting on user space. So the idea that we have is that we are going to provide some tools that support some common metrics. So maybe in some cases you don't have to write the eBPF code by yourself. So let me show you a demonstration of this one. Okay, so this is the same example to count syscalls. So as you can see, there are two files there. One is the BPF code, the other one is like a configuration file. So this is the BPF code that we use to, to gather that information for, from the kernel. So very similar to the BPF exporter case. The only difference there is that we are providing this mount namespace ID. So this is a number that we can associate with each specific container. So Inspector Gadget will automatically map this number to the container pod namespace and whatever there. Again, this is very similar. This is our eBPF map that we are using there. And this is the eBPF program that we use to, to gather the data from the kernel. So yeah, it's really similar to the BPF, to the BPF exporter case. And let me show you the configuration file. In this case, this is simpler. So we have what is the name of, of the tool. And we say, OK, this tool provides metrics, and the metrics are stored on a BPF mod that is called syscall. So this is allows Inspector Gadget to understand what is the BPF mod that it has to read in order to provide the metrics. So again, this is how we explore this. In this case, I'm using like a custom image for this presentation. There I have the G binary and the compiled version of the BPF code that I showed you before. And this is the command line that we have to use to run this tool. OK, so let me deploy all of that there, very similar to other cases before. If we go to Prometheus, yeah, we have to check again. So there we can see that we have our syscalls metric. And as you can see there, we provide a lot of information related to the container. Not only the namespace pod, but we also provide more information like the ID and so on. One thing that we are still missing is that we only provide the number of the syscall, which will be providing also the name. But yeah, this is something that we are still working on. It should not be that difficult to implement. Okay, so I think this is the most important slide of the presentation, the thing that I want you to, to take away from this. And this is metrics are used to understand what is the health and performance of our system. And eBPF is a really powerful mechanism to get, to collect data from the kernel. And there are different projects that provide metrics based on eBPF and based on the depending on the abstraction level that you want to have, you could choose one or another. So maybe you want to write your own BPF code, maybe you only want to configure a YAML manifest, 
and also depending on the labels that you need. So if you only need operating system labels, you can use BPF exporter. If you need also Kubernetes information, then you will have to use something like Tetragon or Inspector Gadget. So yeah, as usual in these presentations, I really like to prepare some reference material. So all the things that I explained today are better explained there. So if you want to go and get more details, you can check, check it out. Actually, the last one is, could be the most interesting one. So all the YAML manifests, all the files to reproduce the demos that I showed you before are available on the repository there. Okay, and finally, this is really important if you have any feedback about the presentation. If you like the presentation, if you didn't, just go ahead and give us some feedback. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. <laughs>